Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I will be splitting my time with the member from Abbotsford. So, mercifully, we are in the dying days of this Liberal government, praise the Lord. Uh, the Prime Minister now is waking up every morning and say, seeing the same polling data that we are, uh, and he knows that Canadians are fed up with his government, and more importantly, fed up with the scandal that we're seeing day after day after day with this government. So SNC-Lavalin, uh, the Mark Norman trial, uh, his uh, illegal trip to the Aga Khan Island, the embarrassing trip to India. He sees that polling data, Mr. Speaker, and he knows that Canadians hate the fact that his record includes increased taxes, the disintegration of relations with major powers, including the United States and China, increased tariffs on Canadian goods and manufacturers, and job losses. And uh, the Prime Minister also recently watched his lunch get eaten in two by-elections. And so I'm sure that the Prime Minister, when he wakes up in the morning, looks at all of this and says, wow, the left, my vote, is deeply divided in Canada. And I hope that I would surmise that he understands that that's a problem for him and, you know, it's probably an upside for the rest of Canada in that his electoral prospects um, have been greatly diminished. Um, so this is why we are seeing the Prime Minister and other leftist leaders put forward motions this week in the House of Commons, even though other leftist leaders in this House have flip-flopped on issues related to the environment, uh, including the NDP leader. So I, I would propose that everything that we're seeing this week is crass politics, Mr. Speaker, and I want to break down why. So rather than giving two rips about fixing any of the problems that the Prime Minister has created or getting my constituents back to work, the Prime Minister desperately needs to change the channel because he hopes that if the press gallery and Canadians aren't talking about SNC-Lavalin, his attempts to influence the independence of the judiciary, his failed record on taxes, the economy, then somehow he can dupe Canadians into giving him another term in government. And so thus enter the left's great push to put virtue signaling, do nothing, empty motions on climate change here in this place. So let me start by saying that climate change is a real problem, and it is a global problem that requires concrete and measurable action to solve. And how we do that, the policy outcome is to what? Reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And Canada has a role to play in that, both domestically and internationally, but we have to do this while protecting our economy and, to reiterate, showing that we are actually reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But how we do that, those policies are not what any leftist leader, especially the Prime Minister, the leader of the Liberal Party, wants to talk about in this place. So much like his virtue signaling on feminism, his fake feminism, right? He's such a feminist. But then, you know, unceremoniously turfs a strong Indigenous woman from his cabinet, a strong physician after taking credit for their CVs. He turfs them, the great feminist, right? Nice virtue signal there. Same thing on immigration, same thing on the economy. I could speak at length at that, but I won't. He wants Canadians to get super duper excited about his virtue signaling on climate change because he wants to distract from his scandal yep. and the fact that he has done absolutely nothing, nothing, nothing to what? Reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So one of my colleagues here said, we have no choice but to act. <laughs> okay, well, why haven't you acted for three and a half years? We're in the dying days of these parliaments. This virtue signaling motion has no policy on how it's going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It doesn't even mention the economy. All of these motions that we're talking about this week have nothing in it about how we are going to meet our Paris targets or how we are going to ensure that the people in my riding get to work. 
And that's why the left is divided, because they're fighting over the dregs of failed virtue signaling policy. And Canadians have had enough of that. So you'll remember um, a couple of Halloweens ago, the Prime Minister and the Environment Minister, the high priestess of the climate change elite cocktail circuit herself, took this picture. They were Captain Planet. They were Captain Planet. They took this like cape and they're like, yeah, environment. What a joke. That is the perfect summary of the Liberal government's climate change approach. It's all costumes, yep. it's all smoke and mirrors, it's all photo ops. That would be fine if it didn't cost Canadians hundreds of millions of dollars, didn't reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and ruined the Canadian economy. So that's why we have to reject any virtuate signaling from this government. Here's an inconvenient truth, Mr. Speaker, a very inconvenient truth. In the last Liberal government, under Paul Martin, Martin and Jean Chrétien, the last Liberal government, the, the climate change crusading Liberal government of the Kyoto Accord. I remember that. That government saw greenhouse gas emissions, what? Grow yeah. by 30 percent, Captain yeah. Planet. 30 percent. That's the last Liberal government's record, okay? And here's another inconvenient truth. The only time in Canadian history we have seen a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions growth, the only time, exactly. was under Prime Minister Stephen, Stephen Harper. Harper. And why? Because we understand that in a Canadian context where it's cold, it's cold here, Mr. Speaker, surprise, we have to heat our home because it's cold eight months out of the year. Also, we're a vast country and we have to what? drive to places because Liberal governments perpetually fail to get transit infrastructure built because they're more concerned about SNC-Lavalin and their buddies than actually getting track built to get passengers off the road and into downtown so cores, true. right? So, true. so we put in place emissions uh, 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 emissions regulations on light-duty passenger vehicles, on heavy-duty passenger vehicles, on the coal-fired sector, and any emissions reductions that this government sees, which is none yet, will be because of those regulations. And why? Because this Prime Minister has said, guess what? I want to shrink the economy by taxing people with a carbon tax. You cannot change people's reliance on carbon in Canada because there's no substitute good. They need to drive around to get to work. They need to be able to put gas in their combines and, and heat their homes. And so you're not going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by putting a tax on it. Hence the $1.80 litre a gas price in Vancouver. The only behaviour that changed was that people in Vancouver go, uh-oh, better not support a carbon tax, and the Liberal, Green, Leftist, NDP alliance in, in British Columbia all of a sudden wanted a pipeline. Now we've got these parties that are saying we need to further reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. We need to cut these, and I agree we do, but we need to further double down on our targets. They can't even meet the targets that they've already agreed to. Why would we support anything that they put forward? This is empty virtue signaling. So yes. what do we need to do? We need to stop reverse tariffs, like allowing the Chinese to dump steel into our country when they don't have a carbon tax, yet our manufacturers have a carbon tax. We have to stop these ridiculous policies that stop clean Canadian products from being bought in our own country. We have to stop importing Saudi oil and start using clean Alberta energy. Here, here. We have to stop all of these things. These are the real measures, sector by sector regulatory approach. We know why the big oil and gas companies stood up and were like, yay, Rachel Notley, $40 a ton. Why? Because they had already priced it into their production. They can buy up the assets of juniors that didn't do it. And then, and then get profits through consolidation. That's not reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We have to take a leadership stance that manages to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, not flip-flopping for votes, not for Captain Planet's right. virtue signaling, and not at the expense of the jobs in my constituency. Yeah. This party, this side of the 
House will reduce greenhouse gas emissions just as we always have done, and we refuse to take the virtue signaling garbage that we hear day after day after day to exacerb exacerbate an important issue for political gain without doing anything to materially support it. Shame. Climate change is an emergency, and the last person on this planet that has any credibility to be able to do anything with it is that Prime Minister. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Questions and comments? Questions and commentaires? The Honourable Member for Windsor Tecumseh. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, um, I don't know if there's a contest today about how much we use the word virtue signaling, but I can tell you this, in terms of what has been said material, this kind of virtue signaling that's spinning like cotton candy. We've got right now a claim by my honourable colleague that they did all of these great things as a Conservative government. But I can recall a promise for cap and trade broken. I can recall a regulation for emissions from fossil fuels being promised broken. And then they had this very popular home energy retrofit program. But oh, we had to cancel it because we need to reduce the deficits. The reality is the only reason that there were emissions reductions was because of the economic problems that we had. That is the reality. I would like to hear very specifically why this colleague believes that there is no climate emergency. I don't know what reality she's living in, but let's just hear a little bit more. The Honourable Member for Calgary Nose Hill. Very specifically, and I believe it's around page 35 of the 2014's Emission Trends Report, my Honourable colleague can flip through that and see, to completely counteract her claim, the only time in Canadian history that emissions growth reduced while what? the economy grew was under a Conservative government. And you know what? Of course we're going to look at a North American context for a regulatory framework, because if the Americans are going to reduce their taxes and make it easier for people to invest in, in, in natural resources, why wouldn't we do the same? Why would we price our jobs out of competitiveness without the Americans contributing to some sort of a North American context? This member probably got up in the House of Commons and was like, oh, yay, Barack Obama, climate change champion. The Americans never put any sort of carbon tax on their industries. It was all virtue and signaling there, too. Why would we put my constituents out of work and send those jobs to the United States, which is exactly what's happening right now? That's not reducing greenhouse gas emissions. That's just shifting the profit and the jobs to a country that understands that we have to make this a global issue. All of these parties here have abdicated the responsibility to make this a global problem. They take cocktails and cannabis in Davos and in all these different conferences, but they refuse to address the problem. We won't. Yeah. Questions and comments? Question and comment. The Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. Yes, so thank you, um, uh, Mr. Speaker, and it's been interesting listening to my friend across the way. And, uh, you know, I can't help but think. It, you know, on the government side, we, we do have a plan. There's a very tangible plan, a tangible plan that has resulted in well over a million jobs in the, since the last federal election by working with Canadians and understanding not only is it about the economy, but you also have to be sensitive to the environment, and we have a plan there with the price on pollution. Now, Conservatives, on the other hand, feel that they don't have to share any sort of a plan. We've been waiting days, turning into weeks, turning into months, and now we're well over a year for the Conservative plan. You know, you, what do we have to wait for? Why can't Doug Ford, Stephen Harper, and Jason Kenney, and the current leader sit around a table and come up with their plan? That's what we're waiting for, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. The real strength in the Conservative Party today here in Ottawa is Doug Ford, Stephen Harper and the current leader, and they have the recent add-on of uh, Jason Kenney, all of which I would suggest to you 
do not have a plan to protect Canada's environment. Why should Canadians have any faith when the only leadership they see coming from the Conservative Party in Canada is those individuals? The Honourable Member for Calgary Nose Hill in 45 seconds or less, Captain please. Captain Planet costumes, money for log laws <laughs> yeah. for refrigerators, $1.80 a litre gas prices. What a plan. Lobbyists and steak dinners that invent programs that have green in it just to get corporate welfare. They're not reducing greenhouse gas emissions. If that's the Liberal plan, I want none of it. And none, neither does any Canadian. And you know what? You're, he's right, Mr. Speaker. Canadians are waiting for leadership. And they're going to get it from the leader of the opposition, the Conservative Party of Canada, when he becomes Prime Minister in October.